Justice Khaled Kaboub from the Economic Court. I had, or oh, still I have a difficulty to, I had a difficulty to choose the subject to speak about today. Chief Justice Strine mentioned earlier the dilemma of the BJR in case of independence committee that examines and evaluate the merging and acquisition deals overall. This issue is becoming more and more relevant in Israel, especially after the new pyramid law a subject that will take place in late session today. Nevertheless, I will not speak about this subject from two reasons. One, in the last two years, I had the chance to decide over the due process of the uh, Independence Committee uh, in Israel. And still in these days, the second uh, reason is that I, I'm sitting these days writing a major decision about this subject. It's a presidential uh, decision, and the Supreme Court in Israel didn't have a chance yet to rule about this subject. So I will hope that Zohar will uh, invite me next year and will speak about that after the Supreme Court will held the decision over that. Hopefully that they'll have a chance uh, with the appeals of the lawyers here in Israel. And I recommend them, I highly recommend them to to take this subject and go to the Supreme Court with it. A one, one important comment I'll start, I'd, I'd like to start with is for, especially for the American audience between us, is to, in order to let them uh, understand better the conflict I'm presenting here today. There is a distinction There is a distinction between the LBOs in the U.S. and in Israel. In the U.S., the LBOs usually includes a merge between the acquiring company and the target company. As a result, the depth which was raised from the transaction becomes the depth of the target company. The creditors receive as a guarantee the assets of the target company. In Israel, it's not, the, it's not the same system. The controlling shareholders usually purchases the control core that is usually is 25% or more of the shares and the debt remains his, not the company's, and as a result, he might be in a conflict of interest with the company and would support a change in its capital structure. I'm not going to speak about the conflict between the, and the confrontation between the interest, between the, uh, 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 I, I'm going to, to emphasize over the conflict between the shareholders themselves in the company. Uh, capital structure is the way with which company finance and overall its growth by using different sources of funds, debt to equity ratio. The decisions regarding the company optimal capital structure are made by the management and the board of directors. Any change in this structure, for example, reduction of capital, distribution of or, pur or purchase of stocks, bonds, raising debt, etc., are made in accordance with the board business judgment rule. And usually the court will avoid, as said before, avoid interference in such decisions, even when these are even when these are following an LBO. The supporters of the LBO in Israel and overall claims they contribute, the LBO contribute to market efficiency because it allows entrepreneurs to execute business plans without having 100% of the capital. These entrepreneurs can also change the structure of the centralized control in public companies as a situation in the Israeli market. The, crit the critics of the LBOs have a negative claim that the LBOs have a negative effect because they damage the company's financial stability. Furthermore, the existing conflict of interest between the creditors and the shareholders is sharpened because leverage buyout companies take bigger risks. 
Moreover, due to the unique structure of the Israeli capital market, which have one major controlling shareholder, in a leverage buyout, the new leverage controlling shareholder, as already mentioned, might have urging liquidity needs, which will affect his, and as a result, the board's judgment to change the capital structure of the company. Company's capital structure following the NLBO. A change in the company capital structure following an LBO raises several questions such as, and not only, one, what is the best interest of the company, which the board and management should promote while making decisions regarding the company's capital structure following a leverage buyout? Two, is the board authorized to make decisions which support the completion of the LBO rather than decisions with, which promote the long-term profitability of the company. Three, what is the significance of the support of the majority shareholders, those with no personal interest in these decisions? A fundamental debate in corporate law is the level of distinction between the best interests of the company as an independence legal entity and the best interests of current, current shareholders. While this issue seems to be purely an academic discussion of the philosophy of law, Different cases, such as, one, as the one described here, indicate that each, this issue arises in, practical as well, in, in practice as well. In the ruling of Israeli court, one can ident identify each of the two perceptions. On one hand, an approach that favors the best interests of the shareholders. And on the other hand, an approach that emphasizes the company as a separate entity. Shareholders who have a large amount of shares and operate in accordance with their own interests and not necessarily according to the interests of the company are defined in the legal world as activist shareholders. The perception is that these activist, activist shareholders are short-term thinkers who are merely, if not only, interested in maximizing their profits for the short term, even if it comes at the expense of the long-term interest of the company. <clears throat> the short-termism versus the long-termism. It is a common to assume that the company's officers are supposed to represent the long-term approach, while pressure over investors, mainly active ones, who wish to see results at the end of each quarter or year, brings the officers to rel relinquish their approach and manage the company with a short-term strategy. In general, it is customary to characterize strategies for the promotion short-term measures as measures which create cash flow in the short term for shareholders. For example, raising the leverage ratio, increasing dividend distribution, execution of significant recapitalization plans, asset sales and sales of company activities. Choosing this, the short-term way doesn't necessarily damage the company and can promote its best interests as well when the company enjoys tax advantages due to raising of leverage. Furthermore, promoting long-term strategy can, of course, benefit both for the company and shareholders who intend to hold their shares in the long term. The main difficulty is that the, cho the choice between long-term and short-term involves preferences which are based on estimation and forward-looking forward projections which are difficult to predict. The law and the courts have to understand the differences and possible conflicts between the controlling shareholder and the rest of the shareholders. On one hand, the controlling shareholder has much influence and power over the company's strategy. On the other hand, he has increased liability with respect to other shareholders. The issue of capital structure and the LBOs is another aspect of long versus short termism issues. Whereas in most cases, the controlling shareholder who invested the most capital would promote long termism, in the case of aggress aggressive LBO, the controlling shareholder might be more interested in meeting his former commitments and obligations to the bank and to the creditors, and as a result will set a short term strategy for the company. In one of my last ruling known as basic derivative action, I examined the board decisions using the enhanced business judgment rule and decided not to intervene with the board's decision 
as well as, as I did in the uh, 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 partner, partner case. I'm happy that the lawyers know the, the name of the case better than me. In basic case, I have mentioned five points to consider in cases such as, such as this. The first one was, was the decision made in a good faith? Two, is the decision made in the company's best interest, best interest as a separate entity? Three, was there a full disclo disclosure to the shareholders? Four, was there support of minority of shareholders? And five, last, what is the company's financial situation? That is, of course, examined by the form of stability of the firm itself and estimation of econ economic experts. It's not a, a, a test that can, it's not a finger test, but uh, we usually use the experts to help us to make the decision about the stability of the company. Thank you very much.